Recording in progress. Hello, I'm Yuri, and I'm here to tell you about a fascinating and inspirational project that I have been working on for many years now. The project is called The Well Maidens of the Summerlands. And before I begin, mainly it's going to be a kind of picture show, mainly because I'm showing you artwork. But I want to tell you first about the Well Maidens. Now, the Well Maidens, if you look around my head, there are various women pouring water from urns. Now, these represent a part of Arthurian mythology that is often overlooked or unheard of mostly. Now, most people are familiar with King Arthur and his knights seeking the Holy Grail. Now, the reason they're seeking the Holy Grail is to restore the wasteland. The land has become barren and everything is dying and nothing will grow and the people are ill and there's no fertility anywhere. So restoring the wasteland is the most important thing to King Arthur and his knights. That story is fairly familiar, but a lot of people don't know why there is a wasteland in the first place. And the reason there's a wasteland is told in a 12th century poem called The Elucidation. And you can look it up on Google. And to cut the story very short, there were well maidens throughout the land. And they were more than human. They were fairy or spirits of place or goddesses or however you want to imagine it, more like the Greek nymphs, which don't mean sexy flirtatious women. Nymph meant an eternal spirit of a place, usually waterfalls, springs, holy wells, rivers, and so on. Now, the well maidens, the maidens that looked after the wells, would take care of travellers, whoever was travelling across the land, pilgrims, knights in armour, anybody could stop at a well maiden and be restored, be given fresh drinking water and, and recuperation and healing if necessary. So they were a very important aspect of sacred landscape and the divine feminine spirit spirits of the land. Now the story goes that one day a very bad king came along and he raped one of the well maidens and he encouraged his men to rape the other well maidens. Now it's because of this abuse of the divine feminine that, and I quote, the well maidens took their golden bowls and left. And as soon as they left, the land became a wasteland. So to heal the land and the land outside of us is also the land inside of us. So there's an outer landscape and an inner landscape and the well-being of one affects the other. So the people need to have a wholesome, healthy, sacred landscape to be healed within themselves. The land and the people are one. So <clears throat> the story goes then that although you might have heard of knights being chivalrous and rescuing damsels in distress, that's very much the shallow pantomime version of events. Really, the elucidation explains that every woman that the various knights of the round table encounter are the descendants of the original well maidens. 
So this project is really about calling the well maidens back to restore the landscape for the benefit of everybody, you know, to make a paradise of earth. And that's the reason for this project. Now, <clears throat> it was first published in 2013 in this book. Oh, that's not working very well. Signs and Secrets of the Glastonbury Zodiac. And the person who envisioned the well maidens was a friend of mine called Barley Mans Morris. And I first moved to Glastonbury in 2001. And my first years in Glastonbury, I was a taxi driver for a company called Tour Taxis. And within the first couple of months, I met Barley and we hit it off and we became very close friends. And we both shared an interest in something called the Glastonbury Zodiac. And as the years went by, I got to know Barley deeper and she shared her inner visions with me. And eventually I agreed that I would illustrate it all one day. And so that's what's come about. Now, sadly, Barley died in two, 2011 and her project was largely unfinished. And so it was down to friends of hers and her daughter, Casey, um, and myself to, to try and breathe life into the project that was kind of unfinished. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go on to a slideshow and continue talking with pictures. So just give me a second. So then here's Barley um, a few years before she passed away. Now, Barley and I shared this interest with the Glastonbury Zodiac. And if you don't know much about it, it is nearly a hundred years old now. And the simple idea is that over a vast part of the landscape, um, it's huge. It's 30 miles around and 11 miles across. And it's called the Glastonbury Zodiac, but it incorporates many other towns and villages. Glastonbury itself corresponds with Aquarius. Now, the woman that discovered the Glastonbury Zodiac, it, Catherine Maltwood, she claimed to discover it in 1925, but we know from her private letters that she was looking at these zodiac signs on the land as long ago as 1917. So it's over a hundred years old now. And simplistically, it's a vast area of Somerset in which different parts of the landscape correspond with different signs of the zodiac. So like I said, Glastonbury is actually just Aquarius and the town of Somerton is Leo the Lion. There's a map of the rough area the big yellow line is the so-called St. Michael line that goes from St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall through Glastonbury Tor to Avebury and onto the Norfolk coast. But the dark green patches are the areas of the Glastonbury Zodiac. Now, Catherine Maltwood, when she first wrote about it and published a book, she didn't call it the Zodiac. She called it the Temple of the Stars. And she was also very inspired by the legends of King Arthur and the Holy Grail. So one of her main theories that she put forward was that the Zodiac itself um, in the night sky above was the actual origin of King Arthur's round table. And that the various knights of the round table represented different Zodiac signs. Now, that idea was there 
has been there since 1925 when it was first published. And Bali and I were fascinated by the whole thing, not to say that we believed in it entirely, but it's a fantastic way of working with sacred landscape. Now, this landscape has waterfalls, many churches, Iron Age hill forts, bridges, hills and valleys. You know, it's such a wonderful sacred space. And to walk around it, visualizing, you know, this area is Leo the Lion and this area is Scorpio and, and this area is Virgo, suddenly the land becomes much more than just a sacred landscape. It becomes a mirror of the heavens itself. So symbolically, you can walk amongst the stars, you can walk amongst the celestial world. And many people now have worked with the Glastonbury Zodiac in many different ways. <clears throat> For Bali, she had spent many years looking at the Glastonbury Zodiac. And then something very astounding happened. Uh, she focused on the central area of the Glastonbury Zodiac and what appeared to her inner vision was one of those amazing uh, life-changing things. You know, I'm paraphrasing conversations she said to me, but she saw the center of the Zodiac opening up like a giant rose, like a shining translucent rose that opened up in the center of the Zodiac. And then from the center of that rose, there appeared a single white pillar of light that gradually took the form of a female goddess figure. So there was this shining white goddess coming out of the center of this magical rose in the middle of the Glastonbury Zodiac. And in her mind, you know, the goddess started talking to Bali and she presented herself as Arianrod, the goddess of the wheel from North Wales. Now, at first in Bali's vision, there was the rose and there was Arianrod in the center. And then like light hitting a prism and then separating into the many colors of the rainbow, Arianrod shone outwards and divided herself into 12 women. Circling around Arianrod were these 12 women and each woman radiated with a different color of the spectrum. And this is very interesting because Bali spent many years as an artist and as a healer and a psychic and a seer working with color therapy, especially a modality called Aura Soma, in which she would use color therapy to help people with trauma and past life trauma and so on. So colors were very important to Bali's way of thinking. Now, Ariane Rod, narrated poetry to Bali and Bali wrote it down. And then as the months went by, Bali had visions with, with each of the 12 women around the Zodiac. And each of them gave Bali poetry about themselves. Now, this was the initial beginning of it all. And then Bali went on to find many correspondences and different ways of working with these 12 women from Arthurian mythology. And, and each woman represents a color frequency, a sound, a shamanic animal, a flower essence, a sacred part of the landscape. Now, after she died, I was commissioned to illustrate her project for her. And these, this first image, each woman in the project of so the Well Maidens 
has three pictures and I'll explain how they work. This is the first three. This is for Ari Anrod in the center of the zodiac. Now on the left hand side is the maiden picture. And the maiden picture always has a water feature. Coming back to the sanctity of sacred water. Now, I've been very fastidious about the artwork and, and the landscape with each picture are real places that you can go to, to interact with these Arthurian well maidens and the sacred landscape around Glastonbury. So the maiden on the left, maiden Ariane Rod is by the River Brew at Wallier's Bridge and you can see Glastonbury Tor in the distance. Now you can go there and stand in the exact same place and meditate and connect with Ariane Rod. In the middle, the middle picture is the woman in her prime. So th this is usually going to represent a landscape feature, solid earth rather than water. And with the middle picture of Ariane Rod, we're at the yew grove, sacred yew grove at Parkwood, which is the center of the Glastonbury Zodiac. So just to recap, the maiden on the left is a water feature. The lady in her prime in the middle is a sacred landscape feature. And the lady on the right, the third aspect of each woman, represents the map of the Glastonbury Zodiac specific to each lady. So behind Ariane Rod on the right is the entire zodiac disc, if you like. Now, I'll slip, flip through them quickly. This project is meant to be used in many different ways, primarily as a way of restoring sacred landscape and restoring troubled landscapes within each psyche. All of us have uh, things to fix and heal inside. So for Bali, the first lady was Sagittarius, and it's the lady Isolde from Tristan and Isolde. Now on the left um, is the young Isolde on a white mare, but the water feature is a real place that you can go to, and it's called Boltonsborough Flights, and it's water streaming out of the third eye of the Sagittarian archer figure of the Glastonbury Zodiac. So this is like water just gushing out of the third eye. The lady in the middle is Isolde in her prime and the landscape beyond her is exactly what you will see if you stand where she is standing on West Pennard Hill. And she's about to fire her arrow towards the tour. Now each lady has a specific color for the color therapy and as oldie's color is sky blue, hence her sky blue dress. And the third image on the right represents as oldie with her lover, Tristan. And um, behind them, you can see the Sagittarius figure shooting towards the bullseye, it literally goes through the park with the center of the zodiac to the eye of the bull, of Taurus the bull. This is real landscape effigies. So each effigy picture on the right helps you locate the landscape area of each lady. The second lady is Capricorn. Now, her left-hand maiden picture represents the young sovereignty goddess called Ragnell, and she's sitting by the river White Lake that flows towards the Tor from Heart Lake Moor. Now in her story, she was cursed by an evil stepmother to be a loathsome hag and she was very badly deformed with buck teeth and ragged hair and a long neck. So that's what she's represented as in the middle. Um, but her true fey self is the face behind her. Now the sacred landscape feature behind her is called Ponta's Ball. And it's the unicorn's horn of the Capricorn effigy. The curse upon her could only be broken if she got Sir Gawain to marry her. 
And of course, the story unfolds and he does. And her happy ever after is that she and Gawain have a young child and that's depicted on the right hand side and behind her is the Capricorn effigy. Her color indigo blue, twilight blue. The third lady is a lady called Dindrain, and Dindrain is the sister of Percival. Dindrain was the only woman to go on the Grail quest. So she's unique in that way. Her, she corresponds with Aquarius and her color is purple. So her maiden image has her standing by the chalice well, blood water, under the yew grove there. And her maiden image has her on Glastonbury Tor itself. And in this role, she's also doubling as Bridey Brigid uh, Brigantia. But she's the Aquarian water pourer and she's pouring forth the Aquarian waters for the Aquarian age. On the right hand side, her posture is suggesting um, bloodletting. Well, this is how she ended her story is very tragic. She, she was on the Grail quest with Percival and Galahad and a knight called Sir Bors. And they came to, a, you know, a kingdom where there was a poor princess who was dying of bad blood and she needed a kind of blood transfer, you know, medieval blood transfer. And Dindrain agrees to give some of her blood to help this ill princess recover. And it all goes terribly wrong. So Dindrain dies herself of hemorrhage, but it represents self-sacrifice. You know, she gave everything to try and help somebody else. It's a tragic story. But each woman in this thing, all of the Arthurian women, they all have different stories and not all happy. Um, and they don't all reach old age, you know, so the, mo the, the motif of maiden mother, grandmother doesn't always work with these ladies. Dindrain never gets much older than 18 years old. You know, she's Percival's younger sister. Behind her is a stained glass window of the fire phoenix effigy of Glastonbury Tor. The next lady is for Pisces, which is Wirial Hill. You've got the Salmon of Wisdom there on the left. And the lady is Elaine. Elaine is the mother of Sir Galahad via Sir Lancelot. Um, in later stories, she's the lady of Shalot who dies of heartache for Sir Lancelot. But as Elaine, she is the mother of Galahad, the only knight to achieve the grail. Now the water feature is an old mill stream on the south side of Wirial Hill and that bridge is really there. You can go and stand on the bridge and look at Glastonbury Tor. Her middle image is the holy thorn of Wirial Hill. I was able to draw it before it got cut down, you know, cut down a number of years ago. And her final image, is an acknowledgement of the Lady of Shalot story where she floats down river on a barge, you know, and in the sails of the barge are the two fishes of the Pisces fish effigy of the Glastonbury Zodiac. The next lady in the scheme is the lady for Aries, the ram, and she's a lady called Kundry, and Kundry is very much Sir Percival's muse. And on the left, she is standing in the Old Reen, which is a drainage river that runs next to Strode College, Strode Sports Centre and Street. And you can go and stand there and see the tour from that angle as well. Now, Kundry can be very, very beautiful and enticing and she can also if she wants shape shift into being very horrible and scary looking and she does both and and they're all ways to try and motivate Percival along his quest either by being an enticing dangling carrot that he pursues 
or being really horrible and scary and kicking him up the bum by frightening him to an action. Either way, she's going to keep pushing him along the path to discovering the Holy Grail. So the reason she's holding a mask in the middle picture is to show her ability to be her ability to be fair or scary. This is Ivy Thorn Hill above street and the white building is an old windmill. You can go there and stand on that hill and it's a wonderful viewing place for looking at the Tor and also the valley of the River Carey. The image on the right is Kundry as the Maiden of the Grail. Her symbol is the dove. Her story is wrapped up in the mysteries of the Knights Templar and the effigy of Ares Street is in the Knight Templar's banner there. This is the triptych for Guinevere. Guinevere corresponds in the Well Maidens project with Taurus. And on the left, it's young Guinevere standing beside, um, I think it's called uh, Coombe Hill Brook or something. It's, it's at Coombe Hill anyway. And it's a little brook that runs down past this lovely old oak tree. Um, Taurus is also Beltane, of course. So she's kind of there as a Beltane May Queen. Now the middle picture, her place of power is the Hood Monument, which corresponds with where the horn of Taurus comes out in the Glastonbury Zodiac. Now, Guinevere, all of these ladies, you know, there's many layers to their stories and Guinevere's later story of being a tragic adulteress with Lancelot is a later version, you know, if you strip things right back, you know, Gwenna, Guinevere is actually the Venus Ishtar goddess of the Brythonic Celts and King Arthur in Welsh mythology had three queens and they were all called Guinevere. So it's a triple goddess that means white spirit or white phantom. So Arthur was originally consort to a triple white goddess, Guinevere, who just like Mary Magdalene becoming a prostitute, you know, Guinevere was diminished into an adulteress who joined a nunnery because of her guilt and shame, but that's far removed from the goddess that she is originally. So she's here with Taurus, Beltane, Taurus is governed by Venus, and even in modern Welsh, still today, the planet Venus is called Gwenna. Now she's the first of the queens in the Well Maidens, and because Taurus is an earth sign, she's the earthy queen. So behind her on the right, by the Taurus effigy, is her disc, so she's queen of discs or queen of diamonds. And the stars inside the circle are five-pointed, eight-pointed, and 13-pointed. And that 5, 8, 13 is the Fibonacci sequence of nature, ferns unfurling, galaxies spiraling, and snail shells, and all the rest of it. So hidden here and there throughout the artwork, lots of secondary symbolisms, you know, like the Fibonacci sequence in that disc. Here for Gemini is Anna. Now, Anna in the first stories is the sister of Arthur. You know, they're both Anna and Arthur are the children of Igraine and Uther Pendragon. Now, Anna in the Well Maidens corresponds with Gemini. And on the left, she's sitting next to a tiny little stream that's called Castle Brook. And it comes out of the east side of Compton Dundon. Hillfort, so Iron Age Hillfort, not far from Street. In the middle, Anna is weaving a tapestry, and behind her is there's an old tumulus, uh, an ancient barrow on top of Compton Dundon, Compton Dundon Hillfort. Now, the importance of her story, I suppose, apart from being Arthur's sister is that her two sons are very, very important to the Grail stories. Her two sons are on the left, Sir Gawain, the good knight, and on the right, Sir Mordred, the bad knight. You know, they're kind of like Cain and Abel, if you like. And one of the Grail quests that Sir Gawain has to achieve, to, has to achieve 
is to find the sword that decapitated John the Baptist. And there's a whole load of mystery traditions wrapped up with Johannite mysteries and yeah, too much to go into. Cancer the crab is a lady called Enid and Enid is part of French romances. There's a wonderful romance called Eric and Enid. And there's a Welsh version of it too in the Mabinogion called Sir Geraint and Enid or Enid and Geraint. Um, it's about the trials and tribulations of two people sticking it together. You know, it's a very hard journey that Enid and Eric or Geraint have. Their entire relationships tested and tested and tested and tested, but in the end, they win, you know, and they become king and queen of Brittany. So on the right hand side, she's there as the queen of bowls or queen of cups, you know. So Guinevere was the queen of discs, Anna was the queen of swords, and Enid here, queen of cups or bowls, grails. On the left hand side, she's at, forgotten the name of the bridge, but it's the River Carey flowing into the Somerset levels just north of Somerton. Can't remember the name of the bridge at the moment. The middle picture is the Somerset levels below Compton Dundon Hillfort. And if you stand by this bridge, you'll see the hills in the background. The hills in the background are Compton Dundon Hillfort and Lollover Hill. Yep. Above her head, sitting on the throne, is the green effigy of Cancer, which instead of being a giant crab on the Glastonbury Zodiac, it's a ship with very interesting geometry. Leo the lion is the Lady Igraine. Igraine is the mother of King Arthur and Anna in the first stories. And her water feature on the left are the fishing lakes that feed off the River Carey just north of Somerton. So you can go to these lakes and stand there and think about Leo the lion because that's the area of that landscape. And the central image, Igraine is standing by the old cross in King Western Churchyard. And there's too much to go into, but the, the bird flying above the cross and the vase at the bottom are all to do with mystery tradition, star law, to do with the age of Aquarius and the grail that's inside everybody's heart center. You know, it's a constellation in the section of sky for Leo called Crater, the wine mixing cup, and very important to many ancient traditions. On the right hand side, she's the final queen of the pattern. She's the queen of uh, spears, queen of wands, queen of clubs, if you like. And behind her throne is the red lion of Leo the lion, which is the Somerton area of Somerset. Now, um, Virgo, Virgo corresponds with Castle Carey, and the maiden here is Argante. Argante is one of the names of the Lady of the Lake, who gave forth Excalibur from the lake. So on the left-hand side, she's in the grounds of Castle Carey itself. There, is, there was a castle at Castle Carey, which is no longer there, but there's the castle grounds, and in the castle grounds, there's a pool and the pool feeds into the River Carey that then flows out into the Somerset landscape. Now, an interesting thing with the Glastonbury Zodiac is the River Carey goes through all of the summer signs of the Glastonbury Zodiac. And the, with the River Brew goes through all of the winter signs of the Glastonbury Zodiac. So there's a summer river and a winter river. It's quite fascinating. So here's Argante at the source of the Carey, the Summer River. Her middle picture represents her by the river in Cainton Mandeville. 
and the church at Cainton Mandeville is dedicated to Mary Magdalene, the goddess of mystery traditions in French medieval law. On the right hand side, she's very much playing the role of the kind of high priestess in normal tarot. That is beyond the veil. You can see their steps going past the veil. Beyond the veil is the Holy of Holies or the mysteries and she's guarding it. And her posture kind of mirrors the landscape effigy of Virgo. This is the triptych for Libra, and Libra is a lady called Nimue, and Nimue is also a lady of the lake, but she was also Merlin's protege, um, and she learned magic from Merlin, and then eventually, according to some stories, imprisoned him in the crystal chamber. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, the maiden is at the River Brew at a place called um, West Lidford Church. There's a weir there at West Lidford. And in the middle picture, you'll see the ruined church tower of East Lidford. Now, East Lidford and West Lidford are both on the River Brew and they kind of act as the scales of Libra. And on the right hand side, you'll see the how that's mapped on the flag in the background. The two crosses represent the two churches, West Lidford and East Lidford, and how they balance nicely. She gets her happy ever after, of course. Now, this is the final triptych of the sequence. Because we began in Sagittarius, we conclude with Scorpio, we conclude with death. You know, death is the end <clears throat> or the moment of rebirth. It corresponds with Samhain. And in the Well Maidens of the Summerlands, it's Morgan, Morgan Le Fay, the Lady Morgan. Now, on the left, the young Morgan is sitting above the source of the River Brew. And I'll come back to that shortly. In the middle, the Morgan Le Fay in her prime, if you like, mother of Mordred, is standing by the River Brew at a place called Alford. That's where the River Brew enters into the Glastonbury Zodiac. And on the right hand side, there's a tapestry behind her of the Scorpio effigy, but there's also various symbols like the serpent on the, on the staff coming down like a girdle is from a very unusual church called Hornblotten Church, which was loaded with occult symbolism and mystery school references, too much to go into. But there are enough visual keys in these cards to facilitate anyone wanting to quest further into the mysteries of the Somerset landscape and the Glastonbury Zodiac. Now, <clears throat> All of the women were visualized as oracle cards and on the back of each woman she has a knight and I'm not getting there isn't time to show all of them but on the left here is Sir Tristan so Sir Tristan goes on the back of the cards of Isolde you know Tristan and Isolde and he's got Sagittarian star law in his imagery he's drawing the bow the harp is there for the constellation of Lyra the harp and so forth. In the middle is Merlin, and Merlin goes on the back of the cards of Ariane Rod herself in the center of the zodiac, if you like. And his staff has the constellation of Draco the dragon going up it, and his shield represents the round table itself, you know. There's also other mysteries to do with the 13 treasures of Britain. But simplistically, he represents the pole stars, the center stars, rather than the zodiac stars. And on the right is Nimue's knight. So after she imprisoned Merlin in a crystal chamber, she became the partner of Sir Peleus, who was a very decent chap and a very good knight. And the bridge behind him is at West Lidford. You know, 
there's just a glimpse that even the back of these cards are loaded with symbolism, iconography, pointing to star lore and mystery traditions. Now, <clears throat> Bali and I uh, called a kind of powwow of all the people we knew that were interested in the Glastonbury Zodiac. <clears throat> this is back in 2010. <clears throat> and when we had a few meetings, some of the ladies, the real world ladies of Bali and her daughter, Casey, and a friend of theirs, I can't remember her name, I'm really sorry, <clears throat> but they decided to pay attention and go and, you know, give honour to the sacred water features of the Glastonbury Zodiac and make, you know, like flower essences and things of those different areas. So they were going to look at the springs and the wells and the pools and the waterfalls and stuff. And myself and a friend called Alan Royce, whilst the ladies were looking at the springs and pools, we decided to look at the two rivers. You know, there's the summer river, the Carey, and the river Brew, the winter river. And that took us way beyond the Glastonbury Zodiac landscape. It took us to the source of the river Brew and a whole load of massive discoveries came out of that, too much to go into. But here's the magic, if you like. The source of the River Brew comes from an area that nowadays corresponds with Stourhead and Longleat, the big, big properties, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. <clears throat> but in the old days, that area of Stourhead and Longleat was known as the Great Forest. The Romans called it Silver Magna, which means Great Forest, and the Britons, the Celts, called it Quite Moor, which also means the Great Forest. And there's an ancient Great Forest from which four rivers flow to the four directions. They flow north, south, east, and west. And you can see them on the map. The River Froome flows north, and the River Wiley flows east, and the River Stour flows south. But here's the magic thing then. I showed you the young Morgan Le Fay sitting at the source of the brew. Now the, the brew flows west, and west is the most important direction because it's the setting sun. It's where the sun goes down into the other world, you know, and it's where souls go when they die. The, the west and the setting sun so important to the psychology of the Celtic mindset. Now, the river Brew flows west and it flows to Avalon. It flows to Glastonbury Tor and it goes beyond. It eventually goes out into the Sabrina Sea, the Bristol Channel. And in the old days, it used to come out into the channel at Breen Down. But in the medieval times, the monks of Glastonbury Abbey diverted it, so it comes out now at Burnham on the Sea. But originally, it flowed from the Great Forest to Breen Down. But if you have ideas <clears throat> of King Arthur going to Avalon when he's mortally wounded on a boat, then he has to travel along the River Brew. You know, and the early stories say that it was Morgan. Le Fay that greeted him and took him to Avalon. Now the River Brew enters the Glastonbury Zodiac at Scorpio. Scorpio death, Arthur's died, and Morgan Le Fay there to take care of him. You know, this River Brew, so important, so very, very important. So in a nutshell then, that's an introduction to the Well Maidens of the Somerset project. Eventually, hopefully before Christmas, you know, this year, it will manifest as an oracle deck with a book. But the whole purpose of it is so multifaceted, multi-layered. Um, it's more than an oracle deck. You're, you're, there's a whole load of philosophy there about healing the wasteland by working with sacred landscape and calling back the well maidens 
bringing them back, bringing the divine feminine back to a land that is threatened by economy and fracking and more and more house building and, and so on, you know, that we need sacred landscape. It doesn't matter if you believe in the Glastonbury Zodiac or not, it's still ancient Iron Age hill forts and rivers and, and old churches and valleys, you know, it's sacred landscape and it needs to be loved. And by working with sacred landscape, going on pilgrimage to places, you restore something inside of yourself. You know, that the land and the people are one. Every place you go to, even if you only go there once on pilgrimage, it stays with you forever. It becomes part of your internal landscape. So there we have it. There's Bali with Ariane Rod on a piece of paper and around her um, silk scarves of the different colours of the well maidens of the Summerlands. Now, <clears throat> if you want to learn more about this, there is a website, and the website is all one word, wellmaidens.co.uk. And there is also a Facebook group called the Well Maidens of the Summerlands. So if you join the Facebook group, when we're ready to promote the Oracle deck and other ideas about restoring the Well Maidens, um, we'll be broadcasting it from there. So thank you very much. And yeah, connect with the land, connect with the spirits of place, heal the inner by working with the outer. Best wishes.